for the next uh, round to join here uh, and uh, to come there. And uh, first of all, Teodorina Lesidrenska, who is the moderator of this panel. She is the program executive for business ethics at globeethics.net. And she is uh, a key pillar of this Global Ethics Forum because the whole concept of uh, and also identification of names was mainly in your hands. She's also well known as one of the co-founders of GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, so she knows this uh, world of uh, the corporate sector with the other sectors from inside. You have the floor for the panel. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, I will uh, take uh, one minute uh, before to sit together with my panelists to uh, make a quick introduction of the people who will be part of this first session, first plenary panel of this conference. Uh, the important role which this, this session will play is to set up the tone to bring this uh, general overview of the issues around uh, inequalities and the role of equalities for sustainable development. Uh, we have a very strong panel of uh, um, leaders, professionals from different sectors with a variety of experiences and uh, the idea was we to give different angles of this question, what are the key issues and what role different sectors of the society, different players uh, should have in addressing the issues of inequality. Uh, having the microphone, I will start introducing my panelists. Uh, I will start with Vasanti, uh, well known, already introduced, uh, chairperson of the Center for Corporate Governance and Citizenship, also associate professor of the I am be a very um, dynamic, full with energy woman. Uh, she also is going to speak not only on her, on her behalf, but on behalf of uh, another powerful woman. Uh, her name is Jayati Ghosh. She is the UN Research Center for Social uh, Development representative and also member of uh, advisory group which was formed under the United Nations for consultation on addressing inequalities globally. A report of, this, uh, of the work of this group was released at the uh, early uh, months of uh, 2013. And this report is an important resource for our conference because it really summarizes from different angles the problems, the um, multi-layered um, issues which the global community of stakeholders need to address. So we have also Mr. Professor uh, Judge Mervyn King, uh, who um, is from South Africa but joined us from Australia. Um, Mervyn is uh, a very well-known leader in corporate governance, uh, a doyen of this field. Uh, he uh, started the King Committee in South, South Africa, which developed a corporate governance code not only for South African business, but also for the Commonwealth, adopted by a variety of Commonwealth countries. Uh, based on the corporate uh, governance code, the so-called King Code in South Africa, many, um, many codes of this sort, corporate governance codes, were developed following the model of the King Code. Also, Mervyn was involved in the uh, development of the Global Reporting Initiative for uh, reporting on sustainability performance. And currently, this is the last uh, uh, very important step he made uh, on the global arena. It is the establishment and being a chairman of the International Integrated Reporting Committee, IRC, which is bringing together the financial reporting and sustainability reporting together as a required reporting platform for business uh, and for further not only for business, for any type of entity. Um, so uh, Klaus is our Klaus Leisinger, a professor uh, 
uh, is our third uh, party. He is the um, chairman, chairman emeritus of Novartis Foundation for Sustainable Development. Also, he is the president of the Global Values Alliance Foundation. And of course, he has been in the area of ethics, corporate social responsibility, sustainability application practical in the practice of business um, all his professional life. Uh, very knowledgeable, um, who will give the perspective specifically of business, but also because of his academic activities recently, he will give a little bit uh, also uh, the view of, uh, of how the young generation uh, hopefully uh, will pick up on the issues of inequality and what are the principles which uh, we have to uh, use in addressing these issues. And uh, we have Bao Ziran, um, representative of our very um, strong Chinese delegation at the conference. Uh, she is uh, working for the Center for Environmental Education and Communications under the Ministry of Environmental Protection in China. And Bao also is a very knowledgeable um, in the issues of uh, environment, environmental protection. Uh, she is a practitioner, but also uh, she is uh, involved uh, on a government level in China in understanding the issues and influencing decision making uh, um, with different government actors uh, in the powerful uh, Chinese government. So now we have our panelists. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I will join them and we will start uh, this session. We will continue until 11 o'clock. We already have uh, a little shorter time than uh, we have planned. On the introduction of the topic, you will be hearing a lot about equal in an equal world. I will just uh, uh, start with a few words um, about the first question uh, I will ask to Vasanti, and this is the question that is supposed to address um, the work done by um, Jayati Ghosh. Uh, I wanted to start with uh, what really has been um, the outcome of this global conversation, Vasanti. You are a friend, uh, actually, of uh, Jayati. You know her work. Um, please summarize the major issues, this uh, outline of areas of inequality which were proposed in the report as key issues to address in the future in the post-2015 <coughs> agenda for development, and also uh, in general what else uh, you think are the key messages. And then in the next questions, uh, which will follow by the end of this plenary, I will ask for your personal opinion. But now this first question is about the report. And please uh, uh, tell me uh, what you have learned and what you want to share with us. Um, I, um, I just uh, need one clarification because uh, Jayati's report, particularly there are three slides in it which are very powerful for the conference. So I just wonder if you would like me to just uh, spend a few minutes or do you just want me to? I think if the slides will bring uh, important, even visual message, we should use it. Okay. Oh, but be conscious about the time. Absolutely. We'll about five minutes to each speaker. Great, fine. Then I think I'm going to take you up on that because <laughs> there's no way, and for those of you who know Jayati and Jayati's work, you know that there is no way that I'm going to be able to do justice to uh, what she has brought to uh, uh, this uh, uh, report and um, Arun, can you help me with this, please? In terms of, I, I think uh, what is uh, important while the, uh, uh, while it is being set up is just to see the background to the report. The background to the report is really a kind of a consultation committee, and they have engaged in exhaustive consultation from across the globe to really ask this key question on uh, inequality. And uh, to us, what uh, is uh, that um, we are really talking about economic, social, environmental, and political domains, and that uh, the report recognizes, and I think it's been mentioned by the other speakers, and all of us are aware that it is harmful and harmful for all of us in the long run. 
But what is important for several of us sitting in this room is, is globalization accentuating and perpetuating the inequality or is it actually um, uh, bridging the divide? And that's something that we have to spend time over the conference, which Kumud has also raised, which I think Jayanti's consultation accentuates really to say, market economies seem to be, we know for sure that there is an asymmetry, and this asymmetry is actually in favor of the advantaged, and that process, it appears, has just contributed even more dramatically to the inequality than what we could have imagined earlier. And that, I think, is very, very important given the stakeholders for this uh, conference. What are the global drivers for inequality? And this is a conversation on every single dimension, which I think Jaiti has uh, report has highlighted, which is very, very important, that concentration of wealth, asymmetries in the mobility of capital and labor, and therefore, will truly globalization yield the kind of uh, reduction in inequalities that we would ex uh, expect. And the last one for me which was important is lack of democratic accountability of corporations and international financial institutions. And that's something that is also worthy of debate and discuss and particularly gets accentuated post the global financial crisis. I think uh, the report's uh, uh, focus is after this, uh, Theodrina, largely around how do we uh, make this happen, yeah? And uh, given that there are basically structural constraints which perpetuate certain kind of systemic uh, aspects, and given the fact that each of the countries in the world are experiencing different stages in terms of economic and social development, how does all of this get compounded when we are looking at inequality? I think that's, to me, is important for this conference with the kind of international participation that we have, and therefore, there are context-specific factors that we have to look at in uh, addressing inequality. And I think Kumut kind of highlighted that when she spoke on her experience in India. And I think uh, Jayati's uh, 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 report is just kind of just providing more evidence to concretize this idea. And last but not the least is how do we make this process? And to me, this is a key message for us for the Global Ethics Forum Conference, that how can each one of us here, I think Jayati's call in this is really, how do we build a strong consensus at all levels? How do we make it happen? What's the role that each one of us can do? And more importantly, and in each of our personal and professional capacities, how can we add, contribute to whether it's the policy, whether it is the legal, whether it is the personal, whether it is the organizational, and kind of pull it together. I think the rest of it uh, can be Theodrina because it's going to be a part of the discussions as we go forward. But I'm just going to leave one voice in the consultation that I found very interesting because here is someone who says, fighting inequalities matter not only to the bottom billion but to all of us. Because equitable societies with accountable and transparent political systems promote the formation of human and social capital. And to me, that's and imp as important as financial and technological capital that we so easily talk about. Social cohesion and stability, because that in turn spurs investment, innovation, and economic growth, and it brings with it a more stable global economy and a more secure world. Thank you, Vasanti. This was a very good uh, closure of a very, very substantial document, which uh, I recommend uh, we get familiar uh, because uh, it's really at the heart of, of the discussions we'll be having. Now, uh, my question to um, Marvin King. Um, it is uh, difficult to decide uh, what exactly to ask you, Marvin, because you have so many experiences uh, being involved in, in the corporate uh, uh, sector, in member and chairman of many corporate boards, at the same time being a judge. So, the ethical aspect you're familiar with. Um, also now involved in major global organizations and movements. Um, maybe the best way to start is the latest uh, initiative you're involved in. It is the Integrated uh, Reporting uh, Initiative, the International Inter Integrated Reporting Council. What uh, um, really in the focus of this council 
is addressing the issues of uh, global inequality. How IRC is addressing the issues of global equality and of inequality? And of course, uh, the other link to that question is, from your perspective, what are these issues? Um, what are the key problems that you, through your professional life, and now as a chairman of IRC, think uh, have immediately to be addressed if we want to succeed? Um, five hours? <laughs> five minutes. Um, let me start by saying that um, International Integrated Reporting Council was formed at St. James's Palace in London uh, towards the end of 2010. It was premised uh, on several issues. The first is something that the President of Intel touched on, that the exclusive approach to governance that is, that um, the company, this artificial person, was an entity surrounded by a moat of shareholders who occasionally permitted a drawbridge to drop down from this island to let other stakeholders onto the island, was in fact an incorrect approach, and the inclusive approach to governance was the correct approach accepting that every organization, I include public and private, uses many resources or capitals, and there's an interconnection between that use of resource and the relationship with stakeholders pertinent to that business, the entity's business. What are their needs, interests, and expectations? Their obligations are quite clearly defined, but the entity was, for some 80 years, has adopted, adopted an exclusive approach until the 90s, 1990s, when the inclusive approach to governance actually took hold throughout the world. That is to take account of the needs, interests, and expectations of your stakeholders. The next premise on which the council was formed at St. James's Palace was that the way we have been reporting, we being corporate entities, companies, or statutory bodies created by governments, state-owned enterprises, was no longer fit for purpose. Because we reported, focused on the financial statements, which was a throwback from the 19th century, when the provider of capital was wealthy families and those members were the directors, when in fact today, the provider of capital are all of us. Because if you look at the provision of capital, today it is pension funds, saving institutions and banks, and that is an individual's money, the ultimate beneficiary or ultimate provider of that money as a depositor with a bank, a financial institution, for example. And yet, um, boards or trustees uh, of entities were reporting in the international financial reporting standard language, which to 999 people out of a thousand was incomprehensible. So consequently, touching on one of the points you made, that there was no transparency because to be accountable you have to be understandable. And yet we very happily went along for some 80 years reporting in a manner that was completely incomprehensible to the licensor of the entity permitting it to carry on business, namely society. An extraordinary fact but a reality. Then the question of value. Value, uh, what does it mean? Um, in the context that we're speaking about here, it is something that deserves importance from a worth point of view, that it's worthwhile. From a purely business point of view, it is a monetary value. But monetary value is one thing. Profit is one thing, but profit in isolation at the expense of impact, of
of the business model of an entity and the impact of, a, of a entity's product is another thing. That was an exclusive approach. No matter what impact there was, as long as the bottom line increased and the share price increased. A very short-term approach, which was one for the Financial Service Board of the causes of the global financial crisis. Value was seen by leaders informing the IRC as being to look at the impact of how the entity carries on business on society and the environment and what is the impact of the entity's product on society and the environment. The next thing is that, taking all this into account, we wanted to create a framework in which an entity could tell its story in clear, concise and understandable language. Accepting that there are laws in different jurisdictions across the world which require an entity to report its financial aspects. So you would have to report Intel would have to report on the financial aspects according to international financial reporting standards. Intel would probably do a non-financial aspect report, a sustainability report that's seen following the G4 guidelines of the Global Reporting Initiative or whatever. But the system had to be created. There's never been a system of, of reporting. I've chaired many entities in America and Europe and South Africa, as Chair Zarina said. And in chairing, when something happens, I've often asked directors, what did we say about this in the annual report? And I always get this glazed look from the director. But ask the company secretary, and he or she knows because he or she put the report together. The other critical issue is that reporting influences behavior. What you report is going to influence the way you behave. And if you are behaving in a bad manner and you report accordingly, assuming you're honest, uh, well, your entity is not going to survive in the modern world of uh, quick information. So, um, the system of Doing an integrated report is integrated thinking, taking account of the business model. How does the company make its money? That's the critical issue. It's all very well learning how much it's made, but how does it make its money? That's the business model. And then the impact of the product on society. If you are the manufacturer of a beverage, and that beverage causes obesity in children, your product has an impact on society. And it's a negative impact. And of course, from an integrated strategic thinking point of view, the board should be thinking of these issues. Consequently, integrated thinking and integrated reporting. At St. James's Palace, the end of 2010, the Global Reporting Initiative, of which I was then the chairman, the chairman of the International Accounting Standards Board, the chairman of the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, the chairman of IOSCO, which is the world body for financial um, entities, the president of the World Bank, the president of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the president of the Institute of Internal Auditors, the uh, executive director of WWF, Secretary General of the United Nations Environmental Program, so you can see disparate bodies. And accounting for sustainability, the entity that was started by Prince Philip in England. In um, November 2010, I was privileged to witness an historic moment. Uh, the President and Chief Executive of the International Federation of Accountants was present. And we agreed that the way we had been reporting for 80 years was no longer fit for purpose. And we had to do an integrated report, which was a report dealing with the way the company in its business model had dealt with its resources it used, including natural assets, 
the impact of how it made its money and the impact of its product or service on society and the environment and not only financial. In other words, an inclusive approach, not an exclusive approach just looking at the shareholder. Marvin, uh, listening to you very carefully, now I would like to highlight what I heard and what probably the audience uh, should extract. I think the most common used word was inclusive and integrated. And this is one of the big issues of inequality. Lack of participation and inclusiveness of everybody concerned into decision making, into um, uh, information analysis, information gathering, uh, even, even into debating issues of importance for uh, uh, different stakeholders and globally. Another uh, term uh, you mentioned, and uh, it is about reporting, which is transparency. Availability of accessible information for decisions to be made. This is also an issue of inequality. People don't have access to information. And when they access information, are they able to understand this information? Is this information uh, just written in a language that is completely misunderstood, or nobody even uh, can read uh, the terminology as is the case of financial reports, which are not understood even by accountants nowadays. Another uh, term I uh, heard was uh, changing behavior and impact, which is linked to also accountability, responsibility. Uh, everyone is equally accountable nowadays. Is this the reality? We have uh, really some being blamed, other being really the problem, but uh, from time to time in the spotlight of the media, and so on and so on. So uh, thank you for highlighting very important aspects of the work you are doing, which are directly linked to the global debate on inequality. Now I will turn to Klaus. Klaus, uh, your experience with Novartis Foundation, how uh, through your work in this foundation, um, actually um, inequality issues uh, were addressed. What are the three key inequality issues which uh, were part of, of your work with Novartis? <clears throat> Thank you. You know, just not to be treated unequal, I will also take 10 minutes instead of five. <laughs> um, to be very straightforward, inequality, if you're not in the Ferrari or Rolls Royce business, inequality is not good for business. If you look at the streets in Spain, in Greece, uh, everywhere in the world, in Turkey and Bangkok, you see results of inequality, not only financial, access, voice, a lot of inequalities, and uh, if you look at the pharmaceutical industry, it's basically access to medicine, which is an inequality issue. It is priority in the research, and it has to do with prices. And the difference between selling Ferraris and selling medicine is that you do not have a customer's autonomy on the product. If you are ill, you need the product. You don't need a Ferrari, you can drive a bicycle. So, what is the special, the, the special responsibility? And uh, if you look at uh, polls, what is important to people all over the world, health is the top issue. If you look at the discussion in the Millennium Development Times, health was the issue. If you look at sustainable development, health is an issue on inequality. And, uh, if you look at the right to health debate, it's even worse. The question here is not what is right and what is wrong. The question is, this is obvious, a complexity and a dimension that cannot be solved by a single actor. So what can you expect from all the actors? Now I'm not talking about others at the moment. I talk about the pharmaceutical industry. Yes, you need new business models. And not only for the developing countries, very probably also for a lot of the developed countries, look at the United States as one example, where you have a lot of people who do not have access to medicine, 
We have a changing age structure at the time where the public budgets are shrinking. That will pose a new pressure on the debate. You need differential pricing. You need the cooperation with the Global Fund. You need a lot of more cooperation, by the way, at the moment also with uh, NGOs and governments. But all I'm saying here is known. It's not new at all. Why is it not happening the way people are expecting? Or is it happening, but it's not visible, or it's not, not appreciated? The fact is that <clears throat> if you have a profitable, a, a capitalist company, be it Novartis or be it others, you do, like it or not, uh, run for profit, you look that you have a higher dividend, and you focus your research and you focus uh, your business activities on where you can make the biggest bang with the buck. That's a fact of life, and that's a fact that plays against the poor. So the question is, if we talk about the pharmaceutical industry, should we make a different change? Yes, we should, because generic industry is in a different ball game than, than the innovative industry. Uh, there is public research, there are public, uh, in the, in public companies, be it in China or be it elsewhere. You know, what could be a, a portfolio mix uh, that uh, is fair to everyone involved? If I, if I ask myself, I have been, until September 16th, I have been with the Novartis Foundation, and I have been working 40 years for in the corporate sector. If I look back, and say, what is the lesson learned? What makes people, what is important? It has to be, it has to be not the question that uh, you are posing, what are the ethical principles? It is, what's the mindset of the top management? What's the, mus what's the ethical musicality? Are they willing, you know, the, the, the lady from Inter was putting up the esteem there. Is it part of their esteem that they do more than a myopic concentration of the financial results of the next quarter? Uh, or is uh, the business of business in their mind just that? Uh, let me say, you know, it's, it's, if, if I have learned one thing, uh, we talk about, uh, uh, with my colleague Max Bergmann and, 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 and Bao Ling Yu, we, we, Bao Zheng Yu, we talk a lot about, about intercultural or transcultural uh, ethical analysis. We have exactly the same transcultural or intercultural ethics within a, a, a given uh, country. Uh, if Max asks uh, at the University of Basel ethnology uh, students, you have a totally different portfolio of expectations than you are ask the MBA students. So, you know, how can we create uh, incentives for people to, to act more inclusive? How can we, you know, if we look sociologically, probably 15 to 80 percent of a population are idealistic people. Nice to have. But that means 82 to 85 percent are not. How can we create incentives for the business to do things differently? You know, the financial sector certainly is not very keen of uh, serving the poor. Uh, not even, as you see, the latest studies on the microcredit, <coughs> micro forget about the rest. Uh, NGOs, I haven't seen too many who are standing up giving applaud to companies who are very innovative uh, and, and, and doing a lot of good things. So incentive, once again, has to come much more from inside probably than from outside. One of the experiences I have is, if you do it for the sake of outside, you will never do it sustainably because the outside fashions change and the expectations change. And let me say, before you get nervous, the last thing. <laughs> Over the past uh, 13 years, I, I have been running, the, amongst other things, the Novartis Leprosy Program. I'm not running it commercially on Novartis or the Novartis Foundation. But we are giving away all the drugs that are needed to eradicate leprosy. Don't you think for a moment that the fact that we give away a drug for free means that the drug is where it is needed, taken by the patient as it ought to be taken, and you know, is used in the way medical science would suggest. So back to cooperate, let's look at, let's give. Einstein once said, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. 
And I, all I'm saying to the inequality debate, let's make it as simple as possible, but let's be aware of the political interests, of the economic interests, of the social agenda, of all the processes that make life interesting and at the same time make life difficult. Thank you. Thank you because you took less than 10 minutes. And also... So let me go on. <laughs> and also, uh, this was uh, an excellent summary of the business position on these issues. And also the business question and request. Let's keep it simple and doable. And also look at all the aspects, all the factors. Um, we cannot uh, just simplify our action agenda too much, so we end up uh, talking too much in a philosophical way about these issues and ignoring the reality we live in. In this reality, people need jobs, the economies need to grow. Now the question is how to do it in an ethical way and in the direction of bridging the inequalities instead of deepening them. Unfortunately, this has been the direction in the last few years. So now, the role of government. Um, we have uh, here a representative of a government agency and also a representative of a powerful nation, one of the most powerful nowadays, China. Um, Bao, Bao really a difficult spot, uh, but I will try to ask a simple question. What really are the main issues from point of view of the Chinese government in terms of inequality? Uh, you know, China is a faster, uh, as a developing country with faster economic uh, growth. Uh, uh, right now, uh, have, uh, have uh, count, uh, countered uh, many uh, major problems uh, in uh, the, the environment uh, perspective. Uh, I can, I can leave some uh, major problem. Uh, at the end of uh, 1912, uh, 298 million people in rural area uh, were suffering from lack of access to uh, safe drinking water. It is unequal to uh, to that area of, of the, the people. Um, and second, uh, we have uh, uh, in order to uh, solve the problem of uh, water scarcity, uh, uh, Chinese government have uh, a uh, announced water transfer uh, project, aiming to transfer some. Uh, uh, 45 million cubic, uh, cubic meters of water per year from south to the north. Uh, this uh, project I, uh, is my, uh, uh, my op opinion, of my, my personal opinion. It is unequal to the people of south area. The third one is to some, uh, to some extent uh, in China, public do not have right channel to access to the inform information, uh, to the environmental information. It is un unfair to the public. That's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are uh, many more and deeper issues uh, during the conference through our Chinese participation. We will be getting deeper and deeper into this debate which is happening in China. Harmony, harmony, I heard when I visit China, is one of the goals to achieve harmony in the society, harmony in the economic development and social development. Harmony equals, in my mind, uh, more equal world. So uh, how China is going to lead in this direction, its own nation, we will be learning during the conference. Now, I would like to go back to Vasanti and uh, just uh, ask uh, something related to the young generation. You, as a professor, 
and also a leader on corporate governance, uh, working with entrepreneurs. Uh, tell us, what really are uh, the principles you think? Three key principles, which uh, uh, the young and also all the rest of us need to keep in mind when they address the issues of inequality. Uh, I think uh, uh, I, I, I'd like to uh, 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 address uh, uh, two of them at this point, not three. The reason is, uh, the first one is really how and where is a sensitization and awareness of inequality happening? Because like Klaus said, all of us know that we live in an une unequal world. So what do we do about it? And I think that it transcends generations. Because it's as much applicable to all of us sitting in this room to ask this question, say, when do we recognize inequality? How do we deal with inequality? And even more interesting, is that a way of thinking and framing what, uh, what decisions we make? Okay? So I think that's a larger question which transcends generations. The second uh, one that I believe that we are beginning to see definitely uh, in the school and outside is uh, a lot more, and I think if you see the context within India in the last few months, in terms of the questions that are getting raised on uh, other, whether it's around governance, whether it's around transparency in politics, whether it's the role of the media, whether it's the not-for-profit, I think this notion of a right, the notion of a rights perspective, in several countries like ours, which are basically what I call as a duty-centered societies, yeah? Our entire lens is around duties and obligations. And I would like to hear from our Chinese delegates on these, because this whole rights perspective, I think, gives a certain kind of a framing that in the short run is going to disturb the equilibrium of several of our countries, because here are a whole generation which is getting trained on a rights perspective, which walks in and says, I have a right to education, I have a right to information, I have a right to health, I have a right. And I think it's that rights perspective which it has kind of come in very, very deeply um, into the vocabulary of uh, the young, which I think is going to, uh, in the short run, pose tensions for countries like ours, but in the long run will also open up what you said, more transparent, more inclusive, more demanding, um, uh, issues around uh, ethics and governance. Of course, all of this is going to breed cynicism, which we should expect uh, uh, to be there. But I think uh, what would also be, what, what I do see is a more inclusive, pluralistic, integrated uh, way of thinking. I do believe that is how it will evolve. Thank you, Vasanti. A good start of our round <coughs> questions on principles. Marvin. Uh, two or three key principles you think of leaders, leaders of international movements, organizations, business leaders, um, should uh, follow when they address the issues of inequality? Well, first of all, um, an acceptance that um, the tools we've used from the 19th and 20th century, which have aggravated inequality, uh, are no, no longer to be used. We need a change of mindset. The mindset is one of an inclusive approach where you look at the impacts of how a company or an entity makes its money and how its product impacts on society and the environment. So you get this very inclusive approach. And there's the question of value creation. We were taught and all nurtured on a basis that value was the present value of expected future cash flows, as if there was no other value creation. Well, value creation means the positive impacts on society and the positive impacts on the environment, and how do you enhance those? The negative impacts, how do you eradicate them? How do you ameliorate them? All this has to be taken into account in integrated thinking, which is what we advocate. And then the collective mind of the board is applied to these issues and says it, tells the story of what's happened, the state of play, 
so that society in clear and understandable and concise language can make an informed assessment that the business of this entity or the activities of this entity, the entity of state, will continue long term in a sustainable manner and hopefully help in the inequality, the battle against inequality. Oh, thank you. Another uh, great addition to uh, the talks about principles and what we have to keep in mind uh, to highlight every time we address, we face even issues of inequality. Klaus, your thinking uh, and your recommendations on what should be the key principles? Yeah, not, not to be philosophical, let me take it down to the ground. I was working about five years in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, running uh, the East African um, business of the SIBA Gaiki Pharmaceutical Corporation. Every time I had visitors from headquarters, the normal thing would be they are in the best hotel, they fly in first class, they eat in the best restaurant, and the offices are cleaned up two weeks before they even arrive. The best presentations are made, and they never get in touch with reality. So I always took half a day with a priest of my, a friend of mine, to take them through the slum area uh, in Nairobi and to expose them to social work. Exposure. You know, people, a lot of top managers live in a totally different silo. They meet the same people they play golf with, they meet the same people they are country clubs, their wives play the same at the same places, tennis or whatever it is, they have even the same uh, coiffure. Point is, only if you see poverty, only if you smell poverty, only if you look into the people, people's eyes who are exposed to poverty, will you understand what poverty is all about. The second thing, I was for many years with Christoph Stückelberger and others in a church economy dialogue, Kirche Wirtschaftsgespräche, where the bishops of Switzerland and some of the top managers of Switzerland would meet twice a year to discuss a specific issue. And uh, the learning curve in the sense of that top manager were exposed to a bishop and say, how can you earn so much? What are you doing with that kind of money? And the reaction to it was something you cannot read in the book. You have to be exposed to it, you have to have the dialogue. And last but not least, I'm a trained economist, and if I have learned something, it is incentives matter and prices matter. Most of the goods we sell today do not say the ecological truth and do not say the social truth. And if there is one task to be done by a government, is to put that right. Thank you. Now, Bao, uh, again, principles, this highlights of what should be um, followed, seen as important directions we need, to, we, need, we need to keep in mind when addressing inequality, especially keeping in mind the context of China, the position the Chinese government plays, and also the powerful role of the government in a country where with one central decision, the reality can change overnight. You know, uh, in China, uh, central government is, as, uh, is uh, at a leading position for the environment uh, protection. Um, so there's some, to some extent, there's an, an not transparency, right, for, uh, for the uh, environmental information. But right now, Chinese government also is trying to, to make efforts. For example, in, 19, uh, in 2008, uh, in China, uh, we issued a uh, environmental, environmental information disclosure, disclosure measures. Yeah, and uh, right uh, in the last year, we also issued a uh, air pollution prevention action plan. And uh, in, in in this plan, uh, we uh, state. Uh, the establishment of 
uh, government, business, and the public part uh, partnership. Yeah. So I think China, uh, 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 with, the, uh, with the development, uh, we have gradually make uh, the information more transparent. <laughs> Thank you. You are highlighting the transparency together with Marvin uh, uh, quite a lot uh, because decisions, uh, in, informed decisions are key in making any type of change. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, we have uh, not much time left to the end of this session and our intention is to make this a little bit more inclusive so there is more equal participation in this uh, discussion. So why not we open to our audience? Are there any questions? Yes? Please introduce yourself. Uh, there is a microphone over there. Just in front of me. To our speaker for the day and uh, all the panelists, I was reminded that we are forgetting the role of values. Yes. Uh, I was just reminded of the two names, Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. We talk about equality and inclusiveness. Gandhi talked about ensuring that we reduce the consumption, making sure that if you have one bread, share it with others. Today we will talk about the corporate's uh, you know, social responsibility. We are saying that 2% as and when we make profit will give it for the betterment of the society. Nelson Mandela talked about the forgiveness. My submission is that Nelson will talk about, uh, you know, see that people who are today not in the same category like us are part of us. <coughs> Being able to expand the concept of self, uh, it will be very difficult for us to really create a equal society. We use technology, innovation, uh, everything. Once we enhance the, you know, our performance, uh, we start allocating it to everybody who is major stakeholders. So my submission is that we have got to ensure both corporates, academic institutions to see that how we institutionalize these values, which are very important for us to sustain truly the inclusions. Thank you. So this is a comment. Uh, it's not a question, right? Is there a question yes. from the audience? Yes, please. Excuse me. Oh, thank you. This is uh, for the president of uh, Intel company, the speaker this morning. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, is it a paradigm shift for uh, a business executive to include uh, <coughs> transparency, business ethics uh, in the discussion? Because my knowledge of business is focusing mainly on amassing profits rather than thinking of social justice or inequality. Thank you. Uh, is Kumon present? Yeah. Oh, Kumon. Um, so I, I did hear a question. I, um, you know, I, I'm not sure, uh, frankly, that it is all that unusual anymore for businesses to be talking about transparency and ethics. Um, I think, you know, and Klaus, you talked quite a bit about uh, that. I think there is growing uh, comprehension in the business world that growth for it to be sustainable has to be inclusive. We have, it, having said that though, none of it is easy. I do agree with all of the challenges that Klaus mentioned, which is, that industry is in it for profit. And so we have to figure out how to incentivize this uh, inclusive growth that we all agree is necessary for the long term. And can I just uh, help you with that question? And corporate social responsibility raised in the comment, 2%. Is really yesterday's thinking. If you think on an integrated and inclusive basis and the mindset of those at the top has changed, then your mindset is one of developing a long-term strategic plan for sustainable value creation, which must include a positive impact on society and environment, otherwise you're not going to have long-term value creation. So integrated thinking, resulting in an integrated report, clear, concise, and understandable language, where you communicate to people in an understandable manner, so it's absolutely transparent. 
is absolutely critical for everyone in society to make an informed assessment about this entity. And then you get the reaction of the greater expectations of stakeholders, which Vasanti spoke about. I call it the Dickensian phenomenon, the greater expectations of stakeholders. You know, the Arab Spring, the Wall Street occupiers. All this has happened, is happening. It's one of the, one of the main drivers. So that major companies today have created a whole new corporate animal, the corporate stakeholder relationship officer. He's or her sole job is to talk mainly to the external stakeholders, to learn what their perceptions are of the company, learn what their needs, interests and expectations are, feed that information to management. Yes. Management manages on a more informed basis. Management develops strategy on a more informed basis. At every board meeting, you should have an agenda item, stakeholder relationships, in which you are informed of how your business model is impacting on those stakeholders, how your product is impacting. And then you develop a sustainable, long-term business model. And it actually incorporates corporate social responsibility on that integrated thinking. We have for decades been looking for a planetary bargain to solve these issues. I believe that a planetary bargain can be created through integrated thinking and doing integrated report, clear, concise and understandable, so that the society at large can understand what is happening with that end. Thank you, Marvin. We are going now to our final statements, which uh, I uh, would like to ask, which is unequal, but to take less time than Marvin <laughs> took to make the statement. And it is a message to the conference. We are just starting it. What do you think? should be important highlight, something we should not miss when we are debating about inequality. And we will start with Klaus. Okay, three points. First of all, let's not only think about rights, let's also think about the corresponding duties and ask who is in charge for what. Second thing, let's work on the short termism. Media are talking in hours, financial analysts in quarters, politicians in three-year periods, and we have to do with slow-moving systems that put a lot of negative externalities over the next 20, 25 years. Last point, and uh, sorry that this comes from somebody who is associated with the industry, let's also, you know, follow the pendulum and, not, and, and ask, what's a wise role of regulation? What's a wise role of the state? It's not all market, it's not all government. What's the optimum? And probably that optimum is different from country to country. Thank you. Now, Bao? <laughs> what do you want uh, the conference not to miss when we debate the public have not uh, much uh, uh, environment uh, knowledge. Yeah, if if some project uh, is planning to uh, to to do in their area, uh, you know, in recent uh, in past uh, few days uh, in China, there's some uh, public accidents. But in, uh, in some uh, uh, extent. Uh, public do not have much knowledge about the environment, so they just uh, heard the the the, the, thing, the the project, and then they go outside to to uh, protect against the government. I think uh, yeah, in, because in, in my uh, institute we have uh, a 
it is duty to uh, educate the public. The role of education and the role of transparency and really action should be based on analysis and understanding of, of the issues. Um, Marvin, three words uh, forwards about your message. What should not be missed? There's only, there's only one... Um, <laughs> Hello, right. There's only one world and that's a sustainable one. <coughs> There's only one future, and that's a sustainable one. If you believe there's going to be a 22nd century, then you will be failing in your duty of care as a director of a company, or a trustee of a pension fund, or an official of a statutory body, if you do not think on an integrated and inclusive basis and look at the positive and negative impacts on all the stakeholders linked to that entity. You've got to think on an integrated and inclusive basis, and you've got to report in an understandable manner. To be accountable, you have to be understandable. And transparency doesn't mean nakedness. It doesn't mean disclosure of confidential information. What it means is balanced reporting, the positives with the negatives. We have a natural human inclination to highlight positives and downplay the negatives. We need balanced reporting so that ultimate beneficiaries can make an informed assessment about the sustainability of this business. Thank you, Marvin. Vasanti. Uh, I think uh, there will be a lot of content in the workshop, uh, in the uh, plenary, but the most important one is what are the mechanisms to move things forward? And that, I think, is as important, the process as the content. And last, how do we actually make access possible? Yeah? And I think those two would be the things that I would look for in the conference. My last words actually, uh, after listening and being involved in the development of this conference even, uh, this is uh, how I see it. We have a lot of research done now. We, we see the big picture. It's a debate already going on. What are the directions and who is responsible for what and so on in the media and in our stakeholder conversations and meetings. What the year 2014 should be, and it is a good start with such a conference like ours, it is what steps exactly we should take. What kind of action, each of us. And if we think personally, individually, what we want to do by the end of these two days, and we'll have the opportunity to get to this at the end of the conference, then I think we'll start the year well, and we will be contributing during the year to the really important thing, action toward a change, addressing these issues on the area and on the level each of us stands at the moment. Thank you very much to my panelists. Manoj, uh, now we have a break coming, so there is uh, a little bit of information from Manoj. Uh, good morning. Can I take a mic? Hello. You are inside. You are in the auditorium of a uh, hundred.